Is liberty dying where you live? Escape to Keen at freekeen.com. Right now, <clears throat> immediately. I, I appreciate that you are trying to make a statement and you want to wear your hats, but, I'm, but in the courtroom, hats are not allowed. You may disagree with that. I'm not going to argue with you about it, but they're coming off or you can leave. That's a law. Do you want to take it off or are you going to leave? I don't have a hat on. I was just wondering if it was That's a law. Fine. Are they coming off, sir? May I? No, you can't. Are they coming off? I, I just... Then, Find them in contempt. Well, it's hats today. Them what is it tomorrow? Why? <clears throat> Why is there a ban? I'm not. I'm not going to jail for that again right now. But that's fine. I'm not. I'm not trying what to. Are you? You're not taking it off. You can make your statements any way you want, but I'm not here today to debate the rule men of the day whether you can wear a hat or not. The form of all courtrooms are no hats. You can. So you can be here with a hat on. Why is that? Why can't there be hats? This is all in our business right now. If the rights of order violate the rights of us all, if we sit by silent, you guys don't have to do it. We just go on the court. You just point it. Uh, you, you could have hey, more. Mr. Mr. Tebow, just take a minute. Okay. Hold on. But take it easy. Why, why is this one down? Why are hats banned from courtrooms? You've allowed them before. It seems to be inconsistent. I'm trying to be inconsistent. I'm trying to treat you all with respect and be totally This is I don't think that's how it's going to be. Why don't you sit down or leave? I was just asking. It's not respectful to take people away who are simply wearing clothing. Would you take off your dress, please? Well, right, let me also say that if there's any more comments from the gallery, I will have you removed. I'm not trying to be difficult with you, but this is a court that requires some decorum and respect whether you agree with it or not. Sure, that's, you address how, that. that's how this court's going to be run. There are no questions from any of you. If you don't like that, you can leave. But if you make any noise, I'm going to have you removed. I'm trying to give you a warning for that. And I expect you to adhere to it. And if you don't want to, either leave or go downstairs. Just seeking clarification. Uh, so, back to the matter at hand. Uh, I've got the. Yeah, Mr. Of... Bernard, when you address the court, you need to stand. I will. You do need so. to stand, Mr. Bernard, if you're going to address the court. I will do so under duress. I'm a quaker, and I don't believe that men are. On, 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 on. You're entitled to your beliefs, but you're in a system now that requires you to stand. I'm not trying to make your life difficult. Just so you know. Uh, so regarding our discussion earlier about the name change, I do have that notice here with Supreme Court reference uh, for your request. That's fine. Why don't you provide it to the state and then I'll take a look at it. I give one to uh, John Webb and here's one for you. <laughs> I didn't have to stand last time. And I think I've been overly permissive, and I think 
it's going to change, which is why I've indicated to you all today that from now on I'm going to treat this differently. Uh, do you have a social security account? I do not. Uh, any legal documents in the name of uh, Brad Freeman? Um, there are a few court documents, and one is attached to the other. Okay, other than court documents? Um, I'm not sure what we can, you would consider a legal document. Um, okay, why don't we move on to your motion? Hmm? Why don't we move on to a hearing on your motion, which brings you here today. Uh, <coughs> yeah, do you want me to speak to that? <coughs> okay. And specifically, this is a motion to dismiss uh, in both practice 2010 S0915 and 916. Well, you had already ruled us in the district court for lack of speedy trial, is that correct? Yeah, you had already ruled on that motion. I wanted to make sure we had the hearing, which according to court rules must be held if uh, something hasn't happened in six months on a misdemeanor and nine months on a felony, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken on that. Uh, that's cited here in my original motion to dismiss. Uh, when I put in the uh, district court rule 2.14 notice to uh, demand to skip district court. I did not go to trial there. I skipped district court and go straight to a jury trial on this matter. That was back in November, and I'm sure I've got the date in here somewhere. But uh, anyway, it was in November, and apparently uh, it took the district court quite a while to even just send paperwork over here. I checked after the first week, figuring it wouldn't take a, you know, a week to get paperwork across the street, but apparently it hadn't even come here in a week's time. At that point, I figured, you know, I've got other things to do. I, you know, run my own business, and I got busy with my life at that point, figuring, okay, well, when the Superior Court gets the documents, inevitably they're going to select a court date, and, uh, you know, they're going to send me notice. So I'll find out whenever it is that they, they get this figured out. I didn't hear from this court for over six months. Uh, it, it took forever to even get the first notice uh, out of this court. Clearly, uh, I mean, as evidenced by you guys shutting down for the, the furlough days, clearly this court is loaded with, uh, with cases. And I understand that uh, John Webb here is you know, a busy guy. He's got a lot of things on his plate. Um, it seems to me to be a clear uh, violation of the, the supposed right to a speedy trial. the benefit of the taxpayers, I would, you know, like to see the, both of these matters dismissed for lack of a speedy trial, and that way none of these jurors have, to have their time wasted. Uh, John Webb can get back to more important matters, actually dealing with real criminals uh, who have actually harmed people. I think that would be the right choice uh, for you to make. Anything else? Well, I could address some of, uh, I guess he's going to be able to speak next, because he's got some points that he made in his objection. I'd be happy to address some of those points. I'm not sure how this hearing is going to be. That's what I do. You can wait for Attorney Webb to make his comments, or you can address his comment, what you anticipate to be his comments based on his opinion. As long as I can speak after he's done, I'd be happy to wait and see what he has to say. Want to address any opinion, Attorney Webb? I do, Your Honor. Thank you. And your shadow? Uh, not unless the court has any uh, questions. I think the record, in terms of the times, speaks for itself. Uh, December 17, 2010 is when the district court matter came to this court. It appears that uh, November 18, 2010 is when the 214 appeal was signed in this report. Otherwise, the state stands on its opinion. Thank you. Mr. Bernard, you can address that. As you pointed out, I ruled on uh, the motion without going to the hearing for the reasons that were articulated in the state's objection, citing the case law and the standard which the court applies, and I was persuaded based on the state's objection um, what was that the motion was properly dismissed. So. Well, what was it that was so persuasive to you? Because, I mean, it's, it's been over six months, and the, you know, the law says I, I think it's unfortunate that it was over six months, and, it, and uh, it would have been nice if it had not uh, that it, if it had been if it had proceeded to resolution within the a six month period. But the, the factors that are cited in the state's objection, uh, which the state uh, 
spoke to, I, I thought, uh, notwithstanding the fact that it was over six months, did not entitle you to a dismissal. If you want to address those, I'm happy to listen to you. So uh, the factors here he cites in his objection is? The factors are, that are cited in Baker versus Wingo, they're on, his, on page one of his objection. Got, well, and, the subsequent, and discuss thereafter. Yeah. The, uh, here on page two that it took uh, you know, nearly eight months for the trial uh, to be scheduled. Um, claims the delay was in no way caused by the state. Uh, that seems to be completely questionable. It was all in their hands. I have not put one single motion or anything like that in because I was waiting to see just how long it took them to even schedule a date. So to say that the delay wasn't caused by the state, that seems clearly false. This was entirely in their hands, see, ever since I put the 2.14 notice in. What they were doing for that six month period, of, or six or seven months, however long it was, that lengthy period of time, uh, was clearly for <coughs> them. points out in point number 11 that uh, it does not appear that the defendant asserted his right to a speedy trial in superior court until the court's recent issuance of the docket notice. Well, how could I? As I didn't know if the court was even going to docket this case. It took months and months for me to get my first notice. As soon as I got my first notice, I immediately put in notice of the speedy, tri uh, notice of the speedy trial. So I was aware of the speedy trial requirements and simply waiting to see what the state decided to do in its delay. And then clearly there's prejudice involved in this uh, in this case. I mean, we're talking about a matter in the first case, uh, 915, where I'm alleged to have stood in front of a police car for a few minutes. I mean, I've been sitting in this courtroom for you know, more than the length of time that the Keen police were allegedly delayed. So I've been under bail conditions, which were fairly restrictive from the, uh, the district court this entire length of time. Essentially, I've been punished prior to even uh, going to trial. Um, so I mean, just on that basis alone, clearly I've been prejudiced against here as I've just continually been kept waiting uh, for this trial to manifest. Uh, again, in the best interest of uh, the budget and the taxpayers, this is a frivolous matter from beginning to end. Uh, it really should be dismissed, and I think I've, I think I've made my case. Well, I'm looking at the bail conditions. Uh, I, don't, I don't see any of those conditions. Am I overlooking something? There was a period of time where uh, last year, I don't know if you, I don't know if you have it, but uh, after the arrest, which resulted in case number 916, uh, I was placed on bail under what essentially amounted to a house arrest. I was unable to leave my property from a certain period of time to another period of time. It was like 6 to 6, so like 6 at night to 6 in the morning. Uh, all of this because of a violation of the first bail where I was arrested for allegedly you know, drinking from a bottle in the city council chambers, which is common for even the city councilors to do. So I wasn't out intending uh, to, uh, to get arrested, but as a result of that, I had some pretty restricted bail. Or you'd agree those aren't the bail conditions in this case? Well, um, those were removed over a period of time. So after a period of time, Edward Berg at the district court did remove those conditions. But, but, but they, nonetheless, and I, they were never conditions in this case to be removed. Correct. Not in 915, but in 916 they were, which is the second case. But either way, bail conditions are what they are, and there are they do restrict my ability to do what I feel is right. Okay, anything further? Yeah, either way, whether regardless of the bail conditions, having this trial hanging over my head has presented, uh, prevented me from being able to do much of anything with long-term plans for my business. I don't know if I'm going to be put, I mean, I know that the, the, the prosecutors at uh, the city wanted to put me in jail for 60 days. Uh, regarding both of these matters. That was the sentence, 60 days in jail, and then hundreds of days suspended. Uh, 
knowing that that is a possibility for my future means that I can't do very much uh, long-term planning with my business, which has put me in, you know, that's an undue burden for me. I can't grow my business in the way that, uh, that I otherwise would have uh, done so, simply because this matter hasn't gone to trial. What, what is that business? Uh, I host a talk radio program on over 100 radio stations across the country. I run a talk radio network, which features different uh, talk radio programs, uh, among other things. And I'm pretty much the sole um, operator of that, uh, of that business. Okay. Anything else? Uh, that's all for now. Hey, Brett, any response? Just a few points, thank you. Um, there, there are two motions to dismiss before the court. Uh, I don't know if the court is considering them both today, but there is some distinction to be made between the two cases. 915 is about eight months old from the time it was sent up. 916 will be nine months old by the time it goes to trial in September. So there's some distinction, just to point that out. Um, in terms of what caused the time lapse from when it was sent here from district court to its trial date, or the two trial dates, the state was merely trying to indicate that um, County Attorney's Office, the executive branch, in other words, was not the cause of any of the delay, did not file any motions <coughs> to cause that delay. Um, and that is the point that I was trying to make in, in my objection. And with respect to um, the notice of demand for speedy trial, the defendant could have put that notice in immediately, did not need to wait for the first document notice to come out. Um, those are the only points I wanted to make. I don't understand how the county attorney's office can't be the one responsible for the delay. Who else would be responsible? Aren't they the ones that make the determination as to whether or not to go forward with something? For all I knew, when y'all were sent the paperwork, they could have decided to dismiss those charges. I don't want to go to trial, so I'm not going to demand a trial right up front. I'm going to let them decide what to do about it. If they decide they want to go to trial, that's at the time when I'm going to, to begin my process, and that's what I did. Well, I, I think in all fairness to the state, the, the, the court probably shares some responsibility for not having the schedule more expeditiously. So, so you're saying it was the, uh, the clerk's office that would have well, handled I, I don't know, but I, I, my sense is that the, 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 both the district and the superior court may share some responsibility for this not being the time to schedule. Right. Uh, so uh, I will look into it. Anything else? Uh, on this matter, I don't think so, but there were a couple other things from earlier. Uh, please proceed. All right. So let me let me say, Mr. Bernard, that, that we had a final pre-trial this morning. You began to ask questions which were not asked for purposes of your own information. You know exactly what the answers are, and, and which is why I declined to spend the time this morning. And I probably will spend the time this afternoon. If you have legitimate questions that you truly don't know the answer to, I'm happy to respond appropriately, but otherwise well, I know what the I'm not going to take the time to answer rhetorical questions. <laughs> I, I don't consider them rhetorical. I, and, I, and while you may allege that I, I know what the answers are, I would like to say I know what the answers are, but until I, I get answers from you, then I don't really know what the answers are. If you don't want to answer them, you know, that's your prerogative. I don't know what the questions are. Mr. Well, I have three questions to want me to ask them again. Are they, are they similar to, am I going to get a fair trial? That was the first one, which you already answered. You said yes. Uh, the second one was, can I get a fair trial if there's a conflict of interest? What's the conflict of interest, Mr. Well, it was a yes or no question. Can you answer that in a vacuum? What's the conflict of interest? Uh, well, who do you represent? Represent the state of New Hampshire. Now, isn't the state of New Hampshire the same party with a claim against me? Just a minute. I'm not going to have a philosophical debate with you about a conflict of interest. This court does not have a conflict of interest. It doesn't have any bias or prejudice for or against you or for the state. And that is not, to me, whether you prevail or you don't prevail. So uh, my job is to determine that the proper law is applied and you get a fair trial, which you're going to get. I appreciate that. Uh, so regarding other matters, uh, about the jury questionnaire, did you want to address that today? You said you would do it. If there was I haven't had a chance to look at it. If, if, uh, I think probably our time would be better spent doing it. Uh, okay. And you said 8.30 for that? Well, I said get here at 8.30. Uh, I don't know how many cases we have <coughs> juries for, but I will, 
uh, meet with you as soon as uh, the schedule allows. Oh, we could, uh, let's see. Question about uh, procedure here at the court. Uh, the clerk downstairs in the red and white dress today refused to identify herself. Is that a problem? She wouldn't tell me who she is. She's wearing a red and white dress today. And she's normally friendly, uh, but today when I asked her what her name was, she refused to uh, give that information. She probably should have identified herself. Okay. That's what I thought. But I will tell you that, that, that and I'm sure it doesn't escape your observation, that, that to the extent that you treat people, not you, but your group treats people <laughs> lightly downstairs, they will probably act in accordance. I think that you, that your group. If I may object to the characterization of, of me having a group, uh, the people that you see here are individuals, and they all have their own individual. I understand groups. that, but I think you are perceived to be the spokesman for them. Right. right, right. <laughs> <laughs> it's a misperception based on the fact that I have a microphone and a you know a talk radio program, so I tend to be a little more visible than the average. Uh, I answered your question. I think, I think she should have been. Another question uh, regarding downstairs. Uh, the, the new phone restrictions uh, seem to really be putting a burden on people here at the court. Uh, you know, it used to be that you could pull. I'm not here to debate with that order. I'm not debating. I'm simply letting you know about something that's happening here. Your agents downstairs, the bailiffs, are taking phones from everybody that walks in. Uh, well, with the exception of one person who it wasn't taken from. But anyway, uh, that that is making it so. If you pull a file then you can no longer simply take a photo of the information in the file. It is a, a severe restriction. I, I understand that it may come with some inconvenience, but it's pursuant to my order. I think it's appropriate. Uh, I'm just going to stand and I'm not going to do it. Would that be considered a discriminatory thing? Any other questions? Yes, I'm wondering if uh, John Webb has a uh, cell phone on his person today. I should be in Keene, New Hampshire with the Free Staters. 